Today we are talking about Nuclear Option with its creator B25 Mitch. I thought this was a good idea because after all in our 2023 simming survey the winner of new sim game of the year was Nuclear Option. This game is not a full fidelity simulator like DCS but it's also not an arcade game like Ace Combat. It is a sim light and plays a delicate balance between simulating things while also being very intuitive and approachable for a wide audience. And I think it navigates this extremely well. I am a fan of this game and I'm genuinely impressed with how the game plays so early into its early access. Mitch has a point of view and is building around it and I wanted to share his game and his thoughts to a wider audience because the simulator space is a small space and the success of games in this space helps the entire niche. So I hope you enjoy this interview with the creator of Nuclear Option. If this is your first time here, this channel focuses on multiplayer sim gameplay. So if you're into that, please subscribe. Today I'm joined by Mitch from Nuclear Option. Uh, this is the game that came out last year, kind of seemingly out of nowhere. And I was really struck by it along with a lot of other people in our community. And I thought it would be interesting to sit down with Mitch and talk about his game and really kind of understand you know, who he is, what he thinks about, and kind of what's what's kind of going on in the background in terms of this game as it as it's shaping up but yeah you know mitch uh you're you're new here so i thought it would be good to kind of uh for you to give a, an intro of like who you are as a gamer and kind of as a game developer like uh, so we can kind of get a sense of what your sort of what, what experiences have you had as a gamer that have been really formative and, and kind of how that's kind of taken you to how you think about nuclear option yeah thanks enigma and uh, it's really good to talk to you today um I think as as a gamer, uh, some of my first games as a kid were uh, either Sims or Sim adjacent. Uh, probably the first Sim I ever played was uh, LucasArts TIE Fighter back in um, 1996 or so, or seven. And um, yes, that game really, uh, I found it really engaging. It just had these mechanics that were super interesting to me. It had um, all these systems and management and um, just an, an you know, 3D world that you could fly around in, um, or 3D space, rather. Uh, and, um, yeah, following that, I, I tried a few other sims in my childhood. Um, uh, I had Microsoft Combat Flight Simulator 3 and um, uh, Echelon Wind Warriors, a bit of a um, quirky title, which was uh, quite futuristic. Um, and then after that, IL-2 1946, and uh yeah that that probably sums up the uh the sims i played as a kid and moving on from that i uh i was really influenced by uh what um Kerbal space program was able to do with their physics and um i think that really got me hooked on the idea of using using rigid body physics in in sims um so making a vehicle out of a bunch of different components uh rigid body components all joined together that um they worked work together to form the simulation. So I think those were incredibly formulative for me uh, as a gamer. And um, it really, I think it, it drove my interest in physics a lot and uh, got me to a point I am today where I just, I, I love physics and I love being a developer who works with physics. It's a, a real passion of mine. So do you have a background in physics or, 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 or just kind of interested in the topic in general? It's a topic that I've grown more interested in over the years. Um, I, I, I took um, a couple of years in, of physics in high school, and um, I went on to study architecture, which, to my disappointment, um, had very little <laughs> physics involved. It was uh, much more design-based. Um, and then after that, uh, I um, sort of fell by accident into the development team on, um, on BeamNG.Drive, and uh, I worked for BeamNG for about nine years, and uh, they are just a team who are... Um, obsessed and passionate about physics and i think a lot of it rubbed off on me okay interesting um yeah it's interesting kind of like the i mean i see it in the game the kind of the blend between the art design and uh and the physics because i mean it, you could definitely feel those two influences so um you know for the people who are listening who haven't heard about nuclear option i thought it'd be interesting if you can kind of give an elevator pitch of you know how would you describe nu nuclear option to a gamer I think the, the thing I usually say is that it's an action flight sim or an action flight game. Uh, it's somewhere between a sim and a game. Um, and it has nukes, so that's the, that's the extra, extra draw. Um, nukes that you can use anywhere, um, not just uh, scripted events. 
Um, so yeah, accessible and fast paced, uh, something that you can pick up and be reasonably good at within a couple hours rather than having to read whole manuals with hundreds of pages. So the way that I um, think about nuclear option is when I really think about the game, um, elegant is the word that I describe nuclear option as. And then elegant, I, I wrote this down uh, for this, but elegant, according to the dictionary, is pleasingly graceful and stylish in appearance or manner, or pleasingly ingenious and simple. And to me, this is what nuclear option is. Um, and it's interesting to me to compare nuclear option to other sim games. So I'm kind of curious on your on your like your kind of your knee jerk reaction to this. Oh well, <laughs> yeah, elegant. Um, uh, I'm I'm flattered. Uh, I hope I think that nuclear option has a ways to go still in its development. And um, yeah, nuclear option has been anything but elegant in the past. And thanks to some um, awesome team members that have joined the team, uh, we've been able to make it a bit cleaner and a bit <laughs> and run a bit better. But um, yeah, I think probably that comes from the um, the fact that it is at its heart a physics game and uh, procedures are sort of thrown to the side a little bit. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons the game is um, set in the setting that it is. Uh, it's, a, it's a futuristic game because it kind of frees up the constraints of having to uh, make all of the, um, the procedures similar to the, to the real world. So um, instead of being a game about flying a specific real aircraft um, or set of aircraft, it can be a game that's just about flying and just about action. Maybe that has something to do with, with the, the elegance that you talk about is that it is more of a pure flying game rather than a, a study of what it is to be a pilot. The reason why I say elegant is because one thing, if I had to choose one example, it's how you tackle electronic warfare. Uh, I forget the name of the, of the of the planes. It's the uh, it's the first jet that you unlock, but it has like a radar jammer, and it's very simple to use, right? You just like switch countermeasure types. You go to the, the the jammer and you hold the button down, and it makes that sound, right? You know the wing, and yep. basically, uh, you know the radar signal is coming to you. Get weaker, but it's just so simple, right? But it's so mm. impactful because, ironically, if you were to compare this to other games like DCS. Right. And this, you know, this channel has a, I would say probably say the majority of the people who listen to this channel are DCS players, right? They mm -hmm. have little, if they're, if they, their electronic warfare experience in DCS is like zero, right? Because that game yep. is really held back by the real, you know, air quotes, realism thing. And because of, um, you know, state secrets, they're not able to model it. Um, and it's interesting because, because they can't model it 100%, they avoid it. And to me, it, it, that's almost seemed like a cop-out because uh, you can make, um, well, I don't know, cop-out sounds, so, sounds bad, but what I mean by this is that like, you could take like some reasonable estimations or assumptions and kind of make it really simple, right? And um, kind of to your point, it's like you're not held up by using real life planes. You can kind of just make things really simple, but, but it adds a layer of, of depth to gameplay and you're not getting held up by, you know, rivets or technical documentation. You just added it in in a very simple way. And that's kind of what I mean by elegant. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And that's that's a real um, motivation of mine to, to make the game the way it is. It's, uh, you know, it lets me make decisions about, uh, like, what kind of gameplay is going to be fun without too much, with, without getting hung up too much on what's realistic. Um, and, you know, uh, I think that, I'll take concepts that are plausible, uh, things that might exist in um, 30 years or 50 years or, or may exist today, um, but we just don't really know that much about how they work in real life. And um, I'll just make the assumption that they work in the most fun way possible. So um, for the radar jammer, it's sort of a question of, okay, um, you know, you've got this missile incoming and you need to deal with it. Um, so as a game designer, I think, uh, what would be the most fun way to defeat the missile uh, within the, I guess, within the limits of plausibility? And uh, yeah, if the radar jammer forces you to fly close to terrain or perform a notching maneuver while using it um, to, to be most effective, then in my mind, that's a, that's a success because you've just made the game a lot more exciting. Actually, okay, so that's you brought up the notching. So it is interesting because um, I did... Well, first off, the game is really intuitive because 
Hmm. Let me think about this. Yeah, this is true. I don't think I ever sat down to read anything about nuclear option. I just saw like, I think I watched a picture or a video of like a nuke going off and I'm like, oh, that looks cool. I'll, 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 I'll try it out. Right. And I hop and I hopped in and like zero reading, right. Straight multiplayer, like let's go. Right. And I just started playing and like, I just understood the game immediately. And, um, and I remember when I got fired on by a radar based missile, I did a notching maneuver and it worked and I was like, okay, they have that model, but I am maybe the kind of pull the hood up on the car a little bit but like how much of that is actually modeled like for the notching and like the rcs is like on the sides of the aircraft like is that like built into the game uh yeah so notching and rcs um they both work together with the um the radar detection system um it's fairly simple i'd say um at the moment uh the each aircraft has a preset rcs um, which isn't yet affected by external weapons, although that's planned um, for the future. And uh, and and that just um, yeah. So a smaller RCS will help you be able to uh, notch radar more easily. Um, and uh, there's some there's some influence of the uh, the height you are above terrain. So ground clutter uh, plays a a role with how easily you're detected on radar. Um, but basically, uh, I've made it as simple as I can right now, uh, just because it's it's easier to um, to test, easier to, to debug. One thing we found with the um, the flares system um, in the initial release was it was it was pretty complex. There were a lot of factors that went into you know whether a flare worked or didn't, whether it spoofed the missile, uh, and it was it was too complex to test, and so we had to throw it out and uh, start start with a very simple implementation, a very random number generator based. <laughs> And then hopefully, um, as we go on, we'll be able to uh, make that a little bit less random by introducing more factors um, as we're more confident that the that the uh, the results are predictable. So yeah, um, it's just a balance between having something that's re realistic or plausible and having something that's predictable enough to get good results that seem fun or fair, and something that's uh, easy to debug as a developer if we notice that things aren't working the way they should or if players complain that it's not very fun yeah the ir missile one that's an interesting one because i would be kind of curious just uh if you can give us an idea of like what what sort of went into it before versus what now just just because like like in dcs for example i think the only things that matter if i remember correctly is like the aspect of the missile shot is the target an afterburner or not and flares themselves are like rant, are like dice rolls, right? It's a is it like miss, 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 or or not, or not a miss, and that's it. And basically, um, my guess is that with nuclear option, the way it works now, it's the flares are just like each one's like a dice roll, right? That's pretty much it, and it's based on your throttle. Um, it, the throttle influences the odds. Uh, so, or, or rather, the um, the thrust of the engine. So you can throttle down to zero, and then over the next few seconds, the engine will reduce to idle thrust, um, and the the heat signature will come down with it. Um, it's pretty basic. There's no aspect considered right now. That is something we're planning to add quite soon. Is um, so uh, our rear shots will um, be harder to break the missile lock uh, if it's looking up the exhaust, or um, uh, perhaps also. Um, if the missile is looking up into the sky, it might uh, have a um, harder time distinguishing the uh, heat signature as well uh, from the background um, emissive value of the sky. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I, it's I guess it's interesting because there's a rabbit hole, right? And and the rabbit hole is as deep as you want to go. So I guess how? Yeah. So I guess the thing is, what are the things that you kind of think about, like in terms of your checklist of, of like trying to put a bottom on the rabbit hole and be like, okay, we're not going to go more deeper than this. I mean, I, I realize now you mentioned like, um, we're building, we need to be able to debug things quickly, but, at, but when it comes to like finalizing things, like how, like, like how do you set the floor if so to speak? Yeah. Well, it. um, I think that decisions may been made for me in a lot of cases, uh, because I, over the, the course of uh, making the game, I've, I've been, um, personally learning a lot. Um, or developing as a programmer and uh, at such a rate that I frequently, you know, see code that I, I wrote two months ago and decide to throw it out and start from scratch. So um, if this, if I'm writing a system that's so complex that I wouldn't feel comfortable rewriting it in a few months, then maybe it's too complex. That's sort of the philosophy that I've been taking lately um, because I know that, yeah, as I grow and develop in my 
competency. Um, so background on me, maybe we, maybe this is uh, better for another section, but um, I'm, uh, I'm an artist by trade. And so this project has been um, a, a steep learning curve uh, in programming for me. Um, I have very little experience prior to, to this, um, prior to maybe 20, 2021 in programming. So as uh, as features get developed, or at least if I'm the one developing them, um, I I know that um, it's there's a very high likelihood that I'll look back on my code and decide that it's uh, it needs to be replaced. So that's a that's definitely a um, a line that I draw when it comes to features. If they're so complex that I might not be able to, um, uh, you know, I might not be able to understand them <laughs> when I look back on them, or if, if it's so complex that I wouldn't want to rewrite them from scratch. Maybe that's too complex, and I think um, in a lot of with a lot of these systems, complexity isn't really necessary. Um, and it's a bit like with physics, um, when you have lots of small, simple objects working in conjunction with each other, the result can be complex. It doesn't take many objects um, interacting with each other to produce a huge amount of complexity. I mean, in physics, um, in uh, in orbits, you have the the uh, the end the end body problem where if even th even three objects orbiting one another is um, such a chaotic system that it's impossible to predict far into the future, uh, and yeah, I think that um, really, uh, I think the sim games that are very engaging are also very complex and as a result um, very unpredictable. But due to the way that a lot of simple things uh, work together in conjunction with each other, with each other due to, due to the way that there's lots of interactions. So um, hopefully my my dream is that I can continue to keep things pretty simple, um, keep these uh, these radar and countermeasure systems quite simple. But because of the um, complex ways they can be um, used and and interact with each other and interact with other systems, the result is really exciting and, unpredict and unpredictable um, in a good way. I like what I'm hearing. Um, hmm, I have so many compliments. And I'm trying to decide which one I want to go over with first. So I'll start with, um, I like what I'm hearing because there's different ways to go about it, right? Because what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is that you are looking at what really defines something, right? And how can you distill things down to, to make things simple, right? Um, easy to make, easier to make, and also easier to understand from a player perspective. Um, and... The way I'm thinking about it is that like it shows more of a, a mastery over or not a, like an understanding of something of like what's really critical versus just like executing a checklist and just kind of like it, it has to do this in this way. It has, you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm and the other thing, too, it's, it's interesting, too, because, um, you know, artist, physicist, developer, like it's just a little surprising, uh, you know, that you just. I don't want to say, you know, nonchalantly just said like, oh yeah, you're picking up development, but it's, it kind of does sound like that a little bit. Uh, I think the project started um, in, in all honesty as a way for me to um, like learn a little bit about, uh, about development from a technical side, because uh, I'd been an artist for, for a decade at that point. And um, yeah, uh, you know, I'd always had this itch to um, delve into some of the, um, some of the code behind the games I work on and um yeah so the game was a little side project to, to try and scratch that itch and uh you know maybe become a little bit better of a uh, tech artist in the process someone who can um someone who can deal with it or understand the technical side of things while being an artist so um yeah it's um it's been a process of learning a lot uh in a very short amount of time uh, but it I wouldn't say that it's been hard because um, this is a game that I've wanted to play for, you know, that for a decade or more, uh, and you know, every little feature is a step towards that dream. So it's never been a motivational problem. It's like a project that has uh, sucked me in and dragged me along. So that that's my experience. Um, uh, you know, diving into uh, the world of programming, and I'd recommend that. Um, I think that it's a world that. Uh, anyone can can dive into um you know anyone who has the interest in it uh sh and and you should and i think that if you're an artist who um you know has a, a curious mind um you know becoming a technical artist is a is a really um it's something i'd recommend because it 
it ma it makes you use different parts of your brain, and uh, somehow it makes other things that you might have um, done in the past seem easier because you have new perspectives on them. It's interesting because if you think about it, because hmm. um, if if you were to do this in a different era, like back in the X Wing versus Tie Fighter era, like it may have not been I don't want to say it may not have been possible, but it might have been much harder just to get the game to in people's hands, right? Because back then you would actually physically have to get the CDs made and actually get, you know what I mean? Put, put it in stores. But now with Steam, because like you basically, my understanding is I think you just self-release, like you don't even have a publisher. So you, you're, you're, you're able to get out there and just digitally distribute everything, right? That's right. It's never, never been easier to make a game than it is right now. Um, it's really incredible, the tools we have, and most of them are free as well. Um, you can, uh, you know, you've got an array of game engines you can choose from. Um, and, you know, increasingly, it doesn't even matter which one you choose because you've got all these features um, for rendering and physics that are just becoming ubiquitous between all the engines. Uh, so, you know, you pick your engine and, uh, you know, pick whichever uh, programming language appeals to you and, and get to work. It's um, it, it's really amazing. And, you know, you can, you can uh, what you have these, what you see is what you get uh, editors. Um, these days where you can just you know play a game in your editor window and you'll see what the final result's going to look like before it's even built so the tools we have um, are incredible and um, yeah definitely i wouldn't have been able to do this in the 90s or 2000s so in terms of um the overall vision versus where we are now with nuclear option i'm kind of curious if you can kind of uh give us an idea of like how far away we are from like the overall vision and um I don't really like to ask about, you know, what's coming, but um, but maybe if you can give some like key themes of like what are some things that you want to dive into. Um, I think you teased out something like like lasers are going are going to be a thing, but I'm just I'm curious to see where you go with this. Yeah. Um, basically, um, <laughs> there's not really a, a hard limit on this. Um, uh, I feel like um, the state of nuclear option right now is. Little is little more than a demo. Um, I would like to have so many more planes in the game, um, and more not just more planes, but more locations as well. Looking at having um, you know different maps, larger maps, and uh, and more detail in those maps. Um, I think it should be uh, it it should have a real depth of content that keeps people engaged for a long time, and uh, and I think using nuclear option. As a um, as a sort of fun uh, experimental <laughs> testing ground for ideas of what future combat might look like uh, is really appealing to me. So, like you mentioned with lasers, um, you know how effective if um, could a laser be? Just um, you know, I guess we don't know everything about um, about the limits of lasers, and of course, the implementation of a laser that I, that we'd be adding to the game is um, you know it's pretty simple. It's just a beam that does damage, but um, physically speaking, how useful would that be for like defending against volleys of missiles or, um, you know, what is, um, yeah, what are the practical limits of these, of these weapons that are um, the weapons and systems? Because uh, the next, um, next aircraft coming to the game is going to be an electronic warfare dedicated system. And uh, it's going to have um, some stuff that we haven't seen in the game yet, like um, uh, directional jamming pods that can target radar sources and blind them. Uh, it's going to have anti-radiation missiles. So, um, yeah, all of these systems, uh, they're just like a fun experiment. Um, I think it's something, it's an experiment for me as a developer and an experiment for players to try out because I don't know how people are going to be using these things. Not exactly. Um, and it's going to have to be tuned and balanced once I see how people use them. Um, but I just see it as an adventure, you know? Um, like the, the whole game is uh, is an exploration of ideas in in aerial combat hmm. so i was gonna talk about this later but i guess i'll talk about it now but um so multiplayer it's it's interesting because sometimes games release without multiplayer day one and they come out early access they do single player first they flesh out the game and then they release multiplayer right um and like even like really big games have also done this done this track as well um, but you're you're a madman. You 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 had I think multiplayer day one. I think I got nuclear option like right around when it released. I think because it had and I if I remember correctly, it had multiplayer then. And I remember hopping on and playing with people. And um, 
I have to say I was really impressed with the multiplayer mode, like a default one. Um, I run a very large server in DCS and the server we have now, uh, what we originally wanted to build, I'm not joking you, it's one for one exactly what the default multiplayer mode is in, in, in nuclear option. It's <laughs> it's like, because like I used to play Dota a lot, right? And like you have like the towers and the creeps who meet in the middle and the map is kind of, the way that nuclear option set up in multiplayer, it's kind of similar to that, which is like, you have the airfields, which are like the towers kind of, like the defensive areas. And then you have like the tanks or the creeps who just march toward the middle. And if you don't do anything, they just kind of nullify each other out. But it's kind of the player interactions with the ground who kind of skew things toward red or blue. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, like where did the idea come from for the original map and like why why even do multiplayer day one? <laughs> right, yeah. Um, oh, there's a lot to talk about here. I might just start with the multiplayer. Um, yeah, uh, so... The first year of development, um, which, which again was just a, a side project for me, um, that it was just you know seeing, uh, you know, is it is it possible for me to make a, a fun plane game? I guess <laughs> with nukes, um, and it was it was single player. So um, I had a, about a year of developing the game um, before I even thought about multiplayer, and there was a really small uh, Discord server I had just with some friends and some friends of friends who. Um, who would jump on and help me test every now and then. And we'd just have a session where we'd stream each other, um, stream ourselves playing single player. And we'd just be talking about, you know, what the game was like to play. And um, in a lot of ways, the gameplay was pretty similar to what we have now, just with a lot less content and, um, you know, a lot, <laughs> a lot worse content. Uh, but the feedback I, I got over and over was, um, this would be really fun in multiplayer. Uh, you should you should make this multiplayer. And so um, I hadn't even really considered releasing on uh, on Steam at that point, but uh, I made that my my objective. You know, uh, basically, um, I'd I'd heard I'd heard a lot of other developers' experiences about um, when it comes to multiplayer, and the thing I the thing I hear over and over again is making your game multiplayer is like starting from scratch, uh, and that was absolutely my experience. Um, if your game is not designed for multiplayer, it's probably easier to start from scratch with multiplayer in mind. So uh, that was what I did. <laughs> I um, sort of no. started from scratch. You did? From first print. Yeah, I started the game again. And so it, just bear in mind, like starting the game from scratch, um, it's really just the code. Um, you can still reuse the art assets that you've, you've made previously, but um, you know, you need to open up a new project and, uh, you know, like a proof of concept. I think my first proof of concept was, um, you know, two tanks on the ground in the middle of a big terrain. Uh, can I make, um, you know, can I make the tanks movement on one on one computer show up on the other computer? So that was my first. That was my first test. But like once once that's working, um, that that's like a proof that you can you know transmit um, data across the uh, across the network. And um, you know, if you can do that, you can do anything. So um, yeah, uh, it's probably probably a good six months where I didn't really know what I was doing with multiplayer, but, um, you know, you get through it eventually. And, um, and once you've got those principles, um, you know, integrated into your mindset, uh, it, it's a lot simpler, it, you know, it goes from being 10 times harder to develop a multiplayer game to maybe like 1.5 times harder. And <laughs> it's just a, it's just an additional consideration you need to keep in mind going forward. So it was a, it was a, um, it was a bit of a roadblock for the development initially, but once once um, I sort of understood it a little better, uh, it was definitely worth it. And I'm really happy that um, multiplayer is such a big part of the game now. Um, I'm really surprised, actually. I didn't think that it would be uh, that multiplayer would be as as popular as it is. And uh, it's such a great way to see how people um, interact with each other in game, uh, to see the the tactics they use and and people use multiplayer to. Uh, like tell me whether things are balanced or not and I, I find that really valuable any of those friends who who were requesting multiplayer like try to try to walk you back like you know don't start it over we'll just play single player it's okay like <laughs> is there any guilt there from your friends i don't i don't think so <laughs> they're like just they're like hurry up make it <laughs> yeah no um I, i'm really appreciative that they pushed me towards this uh you know no regrets there and um you know I think they probably wondered what was going on for a few months because <laughs> I didn't really have any progress for a while. 
but um and when i did it was it was a very stripped down version of the game but um we we realized very quickly um within a couple of months i think that um multiplayer is really fun so um even just i think the first version all we, all you had was uh, crickets and you had this like little ui on the screen that let you spawn a cricket anywhere like in the in midair even um and you just spawn a cricket dogfight with some other players and then get shot down and spawn a new one and even that was um you know f funny and entertaining enough to <laughs> keep the game going for an hour so um that was really encouraging and it it um put this vision in my mind and i thought all right now i want to see i want to see lots of people playing the game with all sorts of um vehicles and, and aircraft um, in multiplayer uh, like i want to see what it looks like with 16 people in a server so where did the uh the map mode or the sorry the game mode like where did that idea come from because it feels really good especially just out the gate for an early access like the the like the you know the the game mode for multiplayer just feels great so i'm just kind of curious mm -hmm. like where, where that where did that come from uh yeah so um the uh the game mode um uh escalation i think it is you're talking about um is probably the one that most um most servers are, are running um and uh yeah, it wasn't even really, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like I didn't really have a vision behind it initially. It was just a way to use all of the units that I'd made for the game in one scenario. Um, so to have like a, I guess a conquest mode. So some some games that like non-sim genre games that influenced me um, would probably be Star Wars Battlefront 2, um, uh, the 2006 one, um, where you had different capture points around the map. Um, and in in my mind i thought well you know what if the what if the game was way bigger and instead of capture points they were like whole air bases um that'd be really fun so that was part of um part of the inspiration and um you know i guess there's a little bit of um a bit of, bit of moba um influence as well with the way that um you have these uh hero units which are the players and their aircraft and you have all these little minions which are the ground units advancing towards their objectives um and uh maybe like yeah, um, something like uh, Overwatch or, or Team Fortress 2 style gameplay where you have different classes that support each other and work together. Um, yeah, I think the, I think all of those ideas were, were present um, when I was thinking about how multiplayer should look and the, the game mode um, Escalation or, um, or Total War, as I called it originally. Um, that one is... Uh, yeah, it's just a culmination of all those things, and it's a, a way to like use all of the content for the game in one scenario. So that was actually uh, my next question, was which was about classes, because I actually was thinking about the exact same thing, uh, the TF2 Overwatch type of thing, which is, um, you know, the planes are going to be doing, the planes already do different things, right? And it sounds like there's going to be more specialization with them, which is, which, will, which sounds really exciting. Um, so I'm... It's been interesting because when I play online, I either play on by myself or I play with a few people on Discord, and we're not we're, we're like we're having fun, but we're not like um, doing super try hard like coordination. And I think with a lot of people playing on Xbox controllers, um, I don't see a lot of people typing and coordinating yet. So I'm kind of curious, like, is your ambition or is there like a want from you to when bigger maps come out, like do you want to see people starting to like group up and do things with multi-ship stuff or like kind of like where, I guess maybe and say this in a different way, like kind of what's the end state that you think that you want to see multiplayer look like in the game or like how it should be played? Yeah, I'd really like to encourage people to team up. Um, and that's a tricky thing to do. I think, um, yeah, giving people uh, cues about where their teammates are uh, and, uh, you know, additional options for communicating uh, besides uh, besides chat, I guess. Um, yeah, or, or maybe even um, maybe even missions generated by the uh, by the server missions generated by the like the HQ of your faction um, that that are like uh, transmitted to all the players so they can be coordinated. Um, I think those are all really good ideas um, about. Uh, how to make people work or how to help people work together if they want to um you know not not everyone wants to you know <laughs> wants to like be a, a super try hard team um I, i've seen you know I've, I've seen that happen a few times when i've jumped in the server um people uh, uh, are really keen to you know form um strike groups and you know escort escort bombers and, and that sort of thing and that's great um yeah so i guess uh, you, you brought up um 
you brought up the, like using Xbox controllers and that sort of thing, and, and maybe not trying all that hard. Um, that is, I think that's that's part of. Um, that's something that I'd really like to. Uh, let me start again. <laughs> I think um, when people jump on and they uh, with nothing but an Xbox controller, um, I, I think that's a good thing, and it's something that other Sims uh, have issues with. So, um, one reason. So I've played DCS a fair bit in the in the past as well, and perhaps one reason I don't play it so much anymore is. Um, is just because it's a really uh, it's a big it's a dedication you know you have to you have to um, set a lot of uh, equipment and gear up and uh, it's not something that you can jump in and out of quite as easily as a lot of other games um, and so yeah I, I do want the game to be accessible and I want people to be able to play it in the style that they want to play it in whether that's just you know picking up an Xbox controller and um, you know joining a multiplayer game solo or whether it's you know plugging in the hotas and pedals and um you know coordinating with a with a squadron so yeah all those things are, are really important considerations i think i don't want to be excluding anyone just because of their like hardware limitations or their um you know time limitations because it's a pretty big time investment when you when you want to get deep into a, a, a sim yeah i agree um i mentioned the xbox controllers because i um because it requires two hands so it's hard it's hard to type with it so that that was one of the the thinkings in, thinking in my head which was like oh sometimes chat lobbies are really quiet so uh, or people aren't coordinating as much because everyone's playing with two hands on controller so yep. so that's kind of where my, my, my head was going up but I actually I agree with you because um, sometimes I'm just too tired to deal with all the issues in DCS right and the, and the time commitment and it's just like and it's just nice to just pull out your Xbox controller and just be like, I'm just gonna play a nuclear option. You know what I mean? And you don't have to, it, it, it just works. It's quick to play. It looks good. Um, and, um, and you don't need to like, you know, pull out your VR headset or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, I think people often com compare the game to DCS and I, I try to avoid that because it's a completely different, um, genre really. I mean, you know, flight simulator perhaps but um everything else about it is different and um i think dcs is great and it's done things for the sim community that like no other no other simulator has, has done ever um and and i've spent many uh hundreds of hours in dcs myself um in enjoying it um so yeah it's just a different a little bit of a different approach um and i think the way i the way i think about it is um it's uh it's realistic physics more or less um with arcade or accessible um interfaces and uh procedures so it's like you know let's let's not worry so much about the procedures here um but still um you know get the the thrill of flying a plane um and uh and like the the detail that comes with a a, simu a simulation based approach to to aircraft physics and I think that sometimes um, if you get too hung up on procedures, uh, it, it can actually impede um, not only enjoyment, but um, like even understanding. Uh, and probably a good example, I guess, would be um, uh, Kerbal Space Program, one of my favorite games of all time, um, is a game that has taught so many people about space flight. Um, but there's not a single realistic procedure in that game. <laughs> it's just a, um, it's a game where you build funny rockets and try to get them into orbit or to other planets and uh you know you learn a ton about orbital mechanics in the process you learn you know what an orbit is and and you know you learn about all these maneuvers in um in in space that you need to perform to be able to change orbits but you never learn like anything about you know what being an astronaut would be like in terms of procedures so uh this is a little bit like that um maybe another example would be um you know you can learn to drive a car um, you can even get a license without ever really understanding how a car works or like without ever experiencing driving a car on, on the limits of um, of what it can do uh, just because the procedures uh, taught to you in the process of driving a car are very constraining and they're designed to keep you um, you know far away from the exciting edge of what a car is capable of so i guess in that in that way just to bring it back to nuclear option um 
I, I, I never want procedures uh, to get in the way of um, having a having a fun time flying planes. And um, I think that you know people can learn a little bit about flying planes from the game. Maybe not about what it means to be a pilot and how to resp maybe maybe people won't learn how to responsibly fly a plane, <laughs> but they can at least learn um, you know through experience um, what planes are capable of and a little bit about how the physics uh, works. Yeah, I never thought about Kerbal Space Program that way. I mean, I I mean, I always did know. I, I didn't really play that game, uh, but I but I did know that it really made the topic of like space exploration and rocketry and that sort of stuff like accessible to a lot of people, which is like a huge value. You know what I mean? Mm. Like it'll be interesting to see what these kids who grew up on K on KSP like what. <laughs> like they're gonna get us to mars you know what i mean <laughs> yeah i know yeah <laughs> the whole generation who got trained yeah. already so it so you know there's immense value in that but you but it's i'd never thought about like how that game has no procedures i mean i have i don't play the game a lot i i do have it but that's very interesting that you said it i never really thought about it that way um but you know like while we're on the topic of of other uh, sims um because i um you know i i tend to agree with you it's you know it's uh, or I, I, sorry, I can understand why you wouldn't want it to be compared to DCS because it is a completely different game, and it it, it serves a different niche and all that. But um, you know, I have found in my immediate uh, orbit, um, you know, anecdotal data, of course. But the people that do play Nuclear Option that I know of are all DCS players, so I'm yep. sure there's overlap. So um, this kind of gets to like my, I always like asking like audience questions, but. Um, I'm curious to hear like how you think the game has done in terms of attracting crowds that you were expecting to attract versus um, kind of crowds that surprised you that kind of have showed up. Uh, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I need to be uh, need to be pretty sensitive here because <laughs> all sorts of people have, have showed up and I don't want to offend anyone. Um, I guess uh, it's um, uh, the, the people who've showed up have been... Um, a lot more mature than I was expecting, to be honest. Um, uh, often, yeah, I think I had expected, um, you know, a lot of kids. Um, and I think, you know, kids kids uh, have every right to play the game, and I hope, I hope a lot of kids enjoy the game. But um, the community has had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, the uh, more mature crowd as well. And um, there are a number of, uh, of ex-military um or I think some of them are even um, currently active military. Um, uh, so you've got veterans and and um, and service members playing the game, and that's like that's really humbling for me because you know I'm not. Uh, yeah, I I am very far removed from that world, and um, yeah, it's it's really. Um, I guess it's really humbling when you have a a pilot play your game and say that they enjoy it um, because, you know, I'm not a pilot either. I've um, had a couple of flying lessons in my, in my whole life, but that's about it. And um, yeah, I, I guess um, I'm really happy with the, with the community that we have on, um, on the discord is the, is the main place that, that the nuclear option community exists, but it's just been full of people who um, have so much knowledge about aviation and history and um, you know modern warfare, and they just like there's a there's a feedback and suggestions channel that I just read every day because um, I learn something new every day. You'll have people who dig up the most obscure concepts from the Cold War, or um, you know the latest news that um, about about proposed uh, aircraft that I haven't haven't heard about yet. And so it's like it's like my news source. I'll just read that read that channel um, to keep my my, my finger on the pulse of, of what the community is really wanting and uh it's it's always encouraging because they want what i want okay that's actually a great answer because that actually kind of leads into my next question that i had which was um which is like i'm the sort of feedback that you get um i mean it's not it's great that you're you're reading it and you're you're liking what you read because i think a theme that i'm picking up on is that um you're curious and as you're building out something you know before you started building out this game you weren't an expert in radars right but you had to learn more about radars in order to build the game and yeah. and as you're exploring different topics you know planes to to to, to tackle they're going to be different and you have to understand uh 
what why certain planes in the past like cold war like cold war interceptors had a certain role that they filled and they had certain characteristics that no other planes had um so you're learning a lot so i'm kind of um i'm curious if um if there's like a push pull in the community if people are because like you kind of sit in the middle right you're definitely not an arcade game and you're not like a full fidelity simulator like you're like in, in my mind the way i would describe the game is like a like a sim light game right and uh, yeah I'm curious if there's like a push pull toward in either direction for people to make it more arcadey or, or more realistic and or if people are just or if you don't really get that I'm just I'm, I'm always curious to see if that happens or not there's definitely a push pull um I think um as I sort of mentioned earlier there's some lines that I've drawn uh that make it pretty easy for me to, to decide whether a feature is um you know viable or not in the in the context of the game and uh yeah like um I've I've also made some some rules for myself um, with regards to the setting of the game. Um, and now the the law of nuclear option is um, is not very fleshed out yet, but that's something I I want to um, uh, explore more. Uh, is like you know what is the what is the setting that makes this game um, uh, that makes makes up the background for this game? Like what has caused <laughs> this conflict uh, in you know maybe fifty years from now between two small countries? Um, and, and what's the what's the technology um that allows some of these uh these aircraft that i'm designing so i've set down some i've set some rules for myself and and they're like um uh like no exotic fuel sources uh there's no um no like portable fusion reactors or anything like that uh there's there's some things that would just disrupt um the the game of air combat like in general there's disrupt air combat so much it would be unrecognizable um and having like a a fuel source that was two or three times as as energy dense as um as conventional fuels at the moment um that would be one of them uh everything you know has to it has to be has to be able to fly so if people are suggesting like their favorite sci-fi concept um as like an inspiration for the next plane and I look at it and I'm like, well, you know, the, the center of mass is nowhere near the center of lift. Um, you know, like the wings are in the wrong places. It's not going to fly properly. Um, well, that that's like a, you know, that rules that out. Um, it has to be able to work, obviously, with the with the physics that that make nuclear option run. Um, and I guess other other factors um, in the other direction is uh, like, you know, people will often people will often uh, suggest um, a, a very proceduralized way of targeting um, because you know that's the way they that's the way they're used to from from DCS for example um, like you know you, you have to uh, you have to use um, a, a specific set of systems to um, identify a target and then uh, you know lock a target and then and fire on it um, and and that's something that you know, I'm trying to avoid uh, because you know it, it it hurts the game's accessibility a little bit when you have to go through a, a bunch of procedures to, to to do the most basic type of of attack. Um, so yeah, I, I guess staying between those two extremes, like on the one, um, you know, it's, or staying between those two guidelines, where uh, I'm, I don't want to don't want to let the game become so. Um, out there and futuristic that it loses touch with reality and i don't want to keep it um so tethered to reality that it's uh daunting for for newcomers and, and that's i think that's the tension that i mainly encounter in the feedback and suggestions is uh you know people who want it to be dcs and people who want it to be ace combat hmm. it's a balancing act yeah that's a hard position to be in because <laughs> um yeah, that's an interesting, but I would imagine a hard position to be in. I, I'm, um, I can empathize a little bit from like an, um, because on our server that we have a DCS, we get a little bit of that. I mean, not nearly on the same scale as because you're an actual video game developer and we're just a stupid server, but we get, you know, parties that form that petition us to move things in certain directions. So I can empathize because that's, um, becomes a time suck and you have to think about it a lot. So I, uh, but it is interesting that you have like a set of like rules. Um, so no exotic fuel sources. Uh, it has to fly. So I guess that means no ground vehicles. Or, or did you mean it more that like it has to be flyable in terms of like physics wise? I think that's what you meant, right? Uh, yeah, like for for an aircraft, the the configuration needs to make sense in, in physics terms. 
Yeah. And then are were there any others? Um, I think there are some others. I'm trying to remember them now. <laughs> I think they've, they've just seeped into my subconscious. <laughs> um, ooh. Oh, I might have to circle back around to this. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Anyway. No, no worries. It, 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 it is interesting because you have to stay true to yourself. So um, it is interesting. Um, I guess the, the, to kind of wrap this up, I am curious to hear, I feel like I know, I know what your answer is going to be, but I am curious. I like, I like asking this question, but, uh, what does success look like for you? Uh, I'm going to imagine not to stuff words in your mouth, but I'm going to imagine that success has probably been a little bit different as you've hit different roadblocks along the way. And now that you're released and, and so on, I'm sure the answer has changed, but I'm curious to see where you go with this. Yeah. Um, so last year, uh, I had this vivid dream <laughs> at night where, um, I, uh, like, you know, I was playing a uh, nuclear option and I joined a, a server and there were, you know, um, a dozen or two dozen people in the server and, um, everyone was just having a great time. Like, you know, every, like I could just hear in voice chat that, um, you know, everyone was having an absolute blast. Uh, you know, it was like a, um, it was a this really realistic looking map. Um, and everyone was, um, you know, working together in their roles and, uh, you know, coming up with strategies and, and that sort of thing. And yeah, I woke up and I thought, yeah, that's that's what I want nuclear option to be, and that is, um, and that's like, that's all that's all it would take for me to be happy, I think. Um, and that's that's come through. I've joined I've joined lobbies that are full um, since the game was released in early access, and seen people having a great time and uh, teaming up and working together. And yeah, that's just been um, absolutely fulfilling for me. So um, I'd say in, in that regard, it's uh, it's already been a success. And um, yeah, I just want to. I want to help people have a really good time while playing a game about stuff they love, um, about flying planes. And um, yeah, you know, and if people can can do it with friends, that's uh, you know, that's even better. So that's been um, it's brought a lot of joy to me. I think uh, you know a great message. Uh, so in some ways, you've already you've already succeeded, and it's uh, now we're just adding more cherries on top as we move yeah. forward. Um, anything you would like to for people to think about? Uh, when they think about the future of nuclear option, uh, you know, everyone's on uh, excited for future updates, but uh, anything you want people to think about uh, in the, for the future? Um, I'd like to really, um, one of our objectives is to make the game more moddable. Uh, and I'd like to see what people can contribute to the game. So um, what I'd like people to, to be thinking about is what they want to see in the game, because we'd like to make that possible as well. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty early stages, but um, yeah, we've um, you know, it's one step at a time. We're gonna we're gonna make the game more moddable, and I think that that's something that a lot of people have been asking for. And you know, we're gonna start we're gonna start with just like skins, so people can make their own skins for aircraft. But um, you know, fingers crossed, there's gonna be a lot more that you can change about the game if you want. It's crazy how fast people make mods. Like I I know uh, that other game, Tiny Combat Arena, like they yep. they opened up mods. I like I I remember it was like I don't know Monday or whatever right and they they announced like oh we're allowing uh, allowing mods and then like by Wednesday they had like the whole fucking world's planes modeled and I'm like what like what happened you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah so but um you know with the um with nuclear option like there's you're not you're not um uh, I don't want to say limited but you're not limited by reality you know what I mean like it, it'll be kind of curious to see what schizo ideas people come up with <laughs> you know I mean? really yeah. interesting. I think it'd be really interesting to see what real planes would be like in nuclear option as well it you was, know what um, oh go ahead sorry yeah like it you know uh, a lot of the planes in nuclear option have um you know they have real life uh, inspirations uh, maybe more than one uh like you know some some planes are based on on more than one real life plane with some with some tweaks uh, but seeing, you know, what a what a faithfully um, simulated plane would do alongside all these fictional ones, that'd be really fun as well. Hmm. Yeah, it'll uh, it'll be neat. Um, all right. I uh, yeah, I don't know. I the way I think about it, like what it, what makes me, I'm really looking forward to. I don't know if you guys plan to do dedicated servers, but I'm really, if you guys do do that, I'm really looking forward to it because I look at like the first pass that I'm calling it on multiplayer. It feels great. It's fun. And as it gets more fleshed out and the maps get bigger and like if dedicated servers ever become a thing and you can have like 24 seven servers. Oh my God. I, I, I can just imagine like these massive, like dynamic campaigns that are going to be going on, you know, like, or these huge, uh, 
what's it called the conquest mode or i forget what you called it ac uh, uh es escalation yeah yeah oh yeah escalation yeah like that would just be amazing if you could like if that could become a thing and it's like a 24 7 revolving server you know door with people coming in and out like i just to me that would be awesome if that's possible um or if they ever get that to that be, point that would be really fun um and yeah, I think I, I share your dream in that regard. Um, there's a few uh, a few things that need to be sorted before we get to that stage. But um, yeah, uh, uh, if things are still doing, you know, if the game's still doing well in a year, um, I really hope to be, um, you know, implementing something like that. Oh man! All right, I'm pumped. I'm I'm looking forward to it. But uh, uh, I always give uh, the person the, the the last word. Anything you want to shout out into the void uh, or? Uh... Um, I just noticed in your questions, did you want to talk a little bit about damage model? Yeah, I guess I guess the question that I had written down was why so much emphasis on damage models? Um, and it was interesting because I remember the first nuke I saw explode. I think I was at an airfield and a nuke went off when I was like starting up. Um, and my plane just turned into a million pieces. And I remember looking at it and I'm like, wow, like... I haven't seen a plane disintegrate like this since like IL-2 1946. And I, I, just, I just remember feeling really impressed. And I was just curious, like, why, why so much focus on this? Um, but I think you mentioned KSP with the what you call it, rigid, rigid. Yeah, physics rigid model? body physics. Yeah, what is that? Yeah, I, I think I got a bit ahead of myself there. When I was talking about KSP, but um, I think even before KSP, I have um, this vivid memory of playing IL two nineteen forty six when I was in like a FW one ninety or something, um, just in a one of those quick combat online servers, and um, I was uh, energy fighting with a with a P thirty eight. And um, anyway, he stuffed up and ended up, you know, uh, basically stationary with his nose pointed up in the air. And I, I just caught him in my gun sights like that. And um, I, I just remember like blowing this P-38 to pieces and like, you know, systematically disassembling it with my cannons. And I thought, this is what air combat's all about. This is, this is super fun. So um, that's that's stuck in my mind. And IL-2-1946 um, had a great damage model for its day. And... Um, the and nuclear option takes that concept um you know roughly the same number of components in a plane and tries to expand on it by giving each component um rigid body physics and joining joining them together with um with joints that can flex and, and bend a little bit yeah i mean it looks believable it looks and feels believable like i just it's just uh i mean i just i you know what? i just you just fucking nailed it i mean it just it looks and feels really good um and it's funny because the planes aren't real right they're they're made up planes but yeah but the way they move around and kind of interact with each other it feels more real than than some other games in some ways um not to make comparisons too much but i i just mean it that like it's very convincing um so that's great anything else you want to share out to the community well i mean i mean oh sorry actually before you do let me i'll, I'll say it so um nuclear option it's on steam very fun game i like it uh, Mitch, I actually didn't tell you this, and I know because you're not familiar with the channel, because you've been so busy uh, doing art and uh, story building for the lore and physics and all that. Um, but um, we had a survey on this channel, and one of the questions that we had was, uh, "What was the sim game? What was this? What was the sim game of the year last year? Um, that was a new release. So Nuclear Option actually ended up winning." Uh, which was the big inspiration for for having this as well. So congratulations. Uh, we're not the Academy Award. I don't have a trophy to give you, unfortunately. But uh, <laughs> but uh, there there are fans of the game on this channel. And uh, anything else you want to close out with? Well, I'm I'm super touched by that. That's that's incredible. I feel feel blown away. Not even sure what to say. Um, it, yeah, thanks for your support, guys. That's that's really amazing. And um, I want to. Uh, like me and and the team with the, with the other people who are now working on nuclear option, we just want to bring you um, an experience that gets you just as hyped as that. Uh, you know, at the end of this next year. All right, great. Thanks, and uh, have a good one. Thanks, Enigma. Bye.